Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, the issue and subject of the day and many days to come, uh, Corona Watch. And with us today, we have Sarah Lineker. She's a, um, a geneticist, which I think is really important for us uh, in our understanding of what's going on with cor corona, coronavirus. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for joining Think Tech this morning. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for having me on your program. It's so exciting to talk about a geneticist. You know, I remember, for example, when this first started happening, or at least coming to our attention in January, uh, I was kind of surprised to find that the Chinese had already developed, already mm, identified the uh, genome uh, for the virus. So that, that was pretty quick. And I wanted to ask you, you know, how, how did they do that? And how did they do it so quickly? And did they have it in their back pocket anyway? Um, and finally, uh, all about that, you know, what good is it to have the genome? Doesn't seem to be doing us much good right now, yeah? Uh, yes, a lot of questions there. Um, the genome of this particular virus is actually quite small as of as are uh, genomes of, of just about all viruses. And so they're really quite quick to, to, to sequence. We can sequence a, a human genome in, you know, in just a few hours. So um, that part is simple. The reason that it's important to know that is the sequence that is, is that will help to provide a foundation for developing a vaccine. So we need to know what we're dealing with, what kinds of proteins and antigens and so forth that this virus can make that we can ultimately uh, develop either um, antibodies or vaccines for. Is it fair to say that we really can't do a vaccine within that year or 18 months that Dr. Fauci talks about um, without having a genome? Well, certainly having the genome gave us a head start because uh, historically we've had to, not we personally, but scientists have had to actually isolate the virus and figure out what we're working with. But we're one step ahead already knowing the, the sequence. And vaccines normally take a good two to five years to develop. So even this 12 to 18 month turnaround is, I, wouldn't, I would say optimistic, but realistic as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of discovery, a question is a very provocative question. We talked about it before the show began. Is, is it possible uh, that this is a, a weaponized virus? Uh, that that say somewhere in uh, Wuhan or near Wuhan, there was a laboratory, a Chinese laboratory that was working on this as a weapon. Yeah, I know that that that's been um, bounced around. That sort of it's it's rumor. Some people are calling it a conspiracy theory. I think um, there's a paper just recently published in Nature Genetics that kind of uh, puts that theory to rest. Um, that it could not, in all likelihood, have been um, uh, genetically engineered. The reason is uh, twofold. First of all, if a scientist were to try to model what aspects of the virus would make it very virulent by using computer modeling, they would not have landed on actually what is making this virus so virulent. And secondly, yes, this virus does have differences in the DNA uh, compared to other types of coronaviruses, but viruses mutate this naturally, their natural evolution is, is to mutate and avoid uh, surveillance by the immune system. You know, viruses mutate about a million times faster than human DNA does. Hmm. Yeah, and is it, and one, one question that came up is, um, and we have, we have had like 50 shows about uh, coronavirus. You should look at our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Um, anyway, one question came up in connection with earlier epidemics, such as the Spanish flu, 1918-19. Um, is it, it, you know, without a vaccine, without any significant, you know, medicines to cure uh, the flu, it, it evolved out, it mutated out. Uh, or it seemed to mutate out. It stopped. It stopped functioning. Uh, maybe you could say that at some low level, it continued from then till now. You know, viruses, you know, come and go and all that. And maybe in large part they stay around. Um, but but is there the possibility um, that this virus, that coronavirus, will sort of mutate um, to a less virulent model, and then the epidemic like goes away mysteriously? What? 
Uh, I suppose that's the case, but it certainly is to the virus's benefit to not mutate in that direction. You know, viruses viruses are really outliers in in terms of biological entities. You know, they're not living organisms. They they they're not made of cells. They don't create their own energy. They can't move and and they can't replicate on their own. They've got to have a host organism. So um, it is not to their benefit to to become uh, you know less less virulent. Um, in terms of the flu, you know we have a lot of um, different strains of influenza, and, and one strain you know caused the Spanish flu, and there have been multiple different strains, and that's why we need to get a you know a vaccine uh, every year for the flu because we're we're so combating different variants. Well, it seems traditionally we've never really, uh, maybe with the exception of Ebola, we've never really uh, created a vaccine that will work. And I'm, you know, I'm wondering, you know, uh, what the, what the natural pattern is, and also I'm wondering if all this mm, um, interest in the virus now, uh, sci scientifically, could result in a medicine or an approach to put it all to bed forever. You know, to to learn enough about this kind of virus, uh, I call it Corona or something related, um, so that we never have to worry about it again. You know, humanity is is freed from the chains of this ongoing, uh, sometimes repeating, sometimes very aggressive virus. Right. So yes, there are all sorts of um, novel types of vaccines that are being developed. And coronaviruses, you're right, are, are a class of virus. So, so, so one, one theory is that we could use um, a sequence from sort of the backbone that's common to all of these viruses and uh, hopefully develop a vaccine against that. That would be interesting because it, you know, it might um, change the population of the world. In other words, uh, there wouldn't be these uh, devastating uh, epidemics from time to time, and people who would yeah. otherwise die would live, and so forth. But you know, the, yeah. you know, you said something earlier, uh, Sarah, that I'm really interested in, in thinking about this. Uh, you know, in a case of a bacteria, you know, it's, it's easy. We know what the bacteria wants. It, it wants to feed. It wants to grow. It, it's like a, a it's like a person. It has a purpose in attacking you. Um, but the virus, it, it's not as clear to me that the, the virus is, uh, is, you know, has a purpose in attacking you, that, that it benefits by attacking you. you know, and I see it as this really dark, wicked thing that just <laughs> kills for the sake of killing. Um, and yet, you know, there's no grand scheme here. There's no, there's no leadership. Is that they just go around the world and they... And uh, they hit yeah. so many people, and it's it's really it's like it's a statement of evil or something. It's it not like, like a. a right. It makes right. a bacteria look look innocent somehow. <laughs> yeah, well, they are they are very you know nefarious things that because they can only survive, they can only replicate by infecting a host. And so, you know, their con I mean, I haven't, their concern is is to replicate and reproduce. So I I don't think that they're, you know, obviously don't have have a thought process, but their their intent is not to kill. Their intent is to replicate and make copies of themselves. And in so doing, yes, they cause disease and they kill. It also strikes me that they've been around for a long time. I mean, if you know, you think of the creation of the world, um, the evolution of the world, um, back when we were uh, swimming in the ocean, uh, and um, you know, they were there, weren't they? The viruses were there. They were they're an essential part of the what do you want to call it? The biological infrastructure of the world, eco, e the yeah. ecology of the world. They've always been there with us uh, as we evolve, they evolve. And so, am I right? Yeah, it's it's in a way it's hard to determine that because viruses, unlike almost every other life form, don't leave a fossil record. They're too small. They don't exist on their own. They die if they're not within a host. So we can't really determine, you know, which viruses were present and when. We, this is an assumption that we make. 
So what's the uh, what's the you know the, what's the logical concept on how to how to deal with them, how to make a vaccine? I mean, they're, you know, they're, you know, back when back in the uh, well in the, in the Spanish flu and before, uh, they were giving the blood of a survivor um, to right. someone who was just getting a disease, and the thought that there was something in that, and we know now that would have been, if if anything, antibodies. Uh, and the antibodies right. of the survivor would help you. Is that always a way a vaccine works? And then the other possibility, and I know nothing about this, is that um, you find you find virus that will create a non-destructive illness, uh, like dead virus or almost dead virus, and, and then you give the person a very low level of, of illness, and uh, that that helps the person develop antibodies, and then and then he or she can can resist the, the disease. Um, I, I don't know if is that the current thinking? Is that the modern thinking? How do we see vaccines these days? Uh, I, we don't uh, taking blood from an individual that's been infected with this virus. Yes, that individual will have developed antibodies, um, and and maybe in the short term. I know Dr. Anthony Fauci has talked about this, that one possibility is to, you know, take plasma and blood from individuals that have been exposed. But that is a very, you know, costly, lengthy process. And we don't know if there, if it's how effective it's going to be. Uh, the, you know, more effective vaccines will be d developed, as you say, um, by identifying which aspects of the virus, which particles will trigger our natural immune system to develop antibodies. And so whether that's, you know, a, a protein, uh, a fragment of RNA or DNA, or, or a, um, sort of an inactivated virus, um, that's the more common way of developing well, What about uh, the, the notion of the lipid, the lipid covering of the particle? You know, I mean, people say that's why you wash your hands because the soap and water combination will make the lipid inert, uh, or rather, it will tear through the lipid. Uh, it will, you know, create a, a fissure in the lipid, and and the the particle will uh, then be exposed to things that make it inert. Um, right. So, isn't isn't it possible to take some kind of soap on a, a molecular level, you know, uh, some kind of solvent, uh, an alcohol, or whatnot? And get to every particle or a sufficient number of particles, um, you know, to to tear through them and make all the viral particles inert. Right. So yeah, a virus is really just made of either RNA and DNA, and it's got, in this case, an envelope that consists of proteins and lipids. Um, soap also contains lipids, and that's why it's so effective because the lipids in the soap will intermingle with the lipids in the envelope of the virus and essentially destroy it. However, once the virus, and that, that works great, and everyone should be doing this, it works great on surfaces, on your hands, but once the virus is inside the cell, uh, we can't access it with soap. That will destroy the, 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 our cells as well. So, okay, okay. so that, that wouldn't work. Yeah, yeah. So you know, another, like another. Uh, thank you. I'm just thinking. <laughs> I actually went, I went to Long's drugstore, and I and I, I caught a pharmacist, and I I asked the pharmacist, <clears throat> "What does it take to dissolve lipid oil?" And she said, as you suggested, other oils, you know, are a way. I mean, solvents are a way, but other oils are a way, like the soap, the oil and soap to dissolve. The other, the other question that springs out of this, though, is is that you know, okay, so I got one particle. Somehow it got on me, and somehow I touched my mouth, my nose, my eyes, you know, and it got into my into my body. One particle, right. just one. Um, am I worried about one particle, or is this the kind of thing where, uh, up to a certain you know trigger point, up to a certain critical mass, I'm not at risk, and after that, then I am. Is that is that the way it works? Yeah, I think it's probably more the latter. Um, you know, we do have two components of our immune system. We have like a natural immune system that, that it is nonspecific. It, it kicks into gear whenever we encounter any kind of pathogen, like a virus or bacteria or whatever. And that, that's our just nonspecific immune system where we, um, you know, initially we can develop a fever, which actually helps to kill the virus. Um, we get inflammation, weakness, because it takes a lot of energy to, to uh, 
to ramp up the immune system. So if we if there are very few viral particles, um, our innate immune system, you know, will likely be able to to take care of that. But once once the system becomes overwhelmed with you know a threshold level of viruses, then 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 we get sick. What's the point of overwhelmed though? Uh, in other words, how do I know I passed the trigger point? Is it that's when I develop uh, symptoms? Is is that what happens? In other words, I, I go through that whole list of symptoms and they start popping up in me. Then I know that I've been overwhelmed and I'm in another another chapter, so to speak, of the development of the particles. Yeah, I mean that. I mean this this particular infection has has very. Um, very specific symptoms, as you know, with, uh, you know, fever and cough. And then the shortness of breath results from the fact that this virus has mutated to um, develop a very um, strong affinity for a particular receptor on the lung cell. And um, that is when people's, you know, really the people that have had you know, either fatalities or severe illnesses is is because um, the virus has attacked the lining of the lung, and we cannot get enough oxygen into our bodies. I'm not sure that answered your question. No, I'm I, yeah, I'm yeah, I'm just uh, I'm wondering. You know, there's a sequence of symptoms, yeah. and I, I don't know which one. The first one is probably something like uh, uh, sniffles uh, or sore throat. A the cough and then the fever, and then mm -hmm. some difficulty breathing. And you know, many, many people, as I'm sure your other guests have said, don't exhibit any symptoms or can exhibit yeah. just one or two of these. So it's it's quite variable. Um, but once once somebody comes short of breath, that's that's where it's becoming um, critical. Okay. One, one point of, of great interest to, to me is the sense that um, these viral particles are like all around us in our world. In, in, a, in a city which is having an epidemic, uh, I say yeah. city because somehow I think that cities are more, 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 you know, more the target than say rural yeah. areas. Um, <clears throat> but so I, I see, I see them everywhere. Little particles jumping up and down, uh, all over on every surface, uh, and waiting mm -hmm. for you to pick up a few. <laughs> And then you pick up a few, you don't wash your hands, and before you know it, you know, you're know you into this process of having them replicate uh, until the point where they, they, they got you. Um, yeah. Is it true? I mean, do you, do you see it that way when you walk around and look at the world? Do you see little particles all over? Do you see that? I think that we've <laughs> all started to, to kind of visualize the world like this. And, you know, I was sort of thinking the other day, gosh, it's, there's just some way we could tag these so that they could be visual to the, you know, visualize, <laughs> like, we would be in good shape. But, um, you know, uh, the, the bulk of transmission is really through coughing and droplets. Um, it does, you know, it does exist on surfaces, and that's why we need to wash our hands constantly. Um, and certainly not shake hands or touch, you know, individuals that could have been exposed. But yeah, it's, uh, I think we're all a bit, I don't want to say paranoid, but very wary. It's a scary situation. You know, a lot of, a lot of products have uh, popped up. Some of them, I'm sure, are scams. But one of them is uh, this notion of the, the, the ultraviolet light. And they say, and, and I did a little looking through the you know, the internet on this, they say that this is used in hospitals and they will wheel this robotic uh, device into a room and, and close the door and it shines the ultraviolet light all over the room and presto digito, <clears throat> no more virus. Um, is that real? Oh, and, the, and then you, you see these things for 20, 30, 40 bucks where you can buy it and you can run it over a surface and uh, they say that it will, it will kill all the virus in that, on, on oh, that surface. You know, is this true phenomenon? Well, I don't know. I, I hadn't heard this. I don't know how effective it is against viruses, but I do know that UV light does uh, induce DNA breaks and DNA mutations. So, uh, you know, it does have the potential to sort of incapacitate the, the viral genome and therefore it would not be infectious any longer. Um, I, I would have to look into that further. To see how yeah, well, you know, that really 
What's interesting, let's assume, just assume with me now, I mean, we're not, this is not science, this is speculation, <clears throat> that if you can get an ultraviolet light to kill the particles or, you know, make them inert somehow, um, <clears throat> by virtue of light, then you're really talking about light now. And if you're talking about light, uh, you could, you know, do, do variation on that theme and shine the light on a given surface, and now you would see the particles colored, oh, let's say, orange. So where yeah. something appears to have little specks of orange or little patches of orange, then the uh, the light would have identified them, and you know that surface is 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 contaminated. Uh, although, that's logic. What do you although, think? Well, again, another good idea. Although viruses are so small, they're sub microscopic. So even so, unless you had a a huge, you know, conglomeration of these viruses on the surface, you still wouldn't be able to see a single virus or 10 or 1000 viruses. So you're better <laughs> off using the old soap. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Well, our lives are certainly going to change here. But you know what, yeah. one thing that I one thing that I see is uh, imagine a sort of a wheat field, maybe a dry wheat field, and there's a little fire burning and the fire sweeps across the wheat field. And most of the grain is is burned. Some may survive, but most is burned. And I see the world as a as a target for this kind of thing. It's it's magic, if you will, is that it can it spread so quickly. And and you know you can't even see it happening, but it happens everywhere. And it's more contagious than any. Am I right? Anything we've seen in the past in terms of a global phenomenon. Um, but you know what what strikes me is that um, this burns through the wheat field, and it kills. Uh, or rather it infects X percentage of the people predictably around the world. It also um, kills X percent and it spares X percent. And, and once we know more about it, uh, we'll know how this, you know, this global, you know, fire in the wheat field thing works. Um, is, is, how do you see that? How do you see the, the wheat field you know, in this kind of context? Yeah, I think, you know, now that we are so interrelated globally, that this, I don't want to sound like a doomsayer, but I think that this will continue to be an issue because of, you know, densely populated cities and global travel. And um, yeah, we are going to have waves of this sort of thing. And this virus itself could even mutate. Once we develop a vaccine, it could, uh, it may well mutate uh, so that this particular vaccine would no longer be effective. Uh, the good news is that at least thus far, since we've been able to identify the virus um, since uh, December, um, we haven't seen mutations in the virus. So it seems to be at least thus far pretty pretty uh, stable. But I think that's um, an interesting analogy. Yeah, so you can make it more virulent. You can make it less virulent. I mean, it, it could become by its own, which I find yeah. interesting because say one particle of this virus, okay, is in deep Siberia, and the other is right outside Rome, just for example. Yeah. Um, so if we say, if we say that the, the one in Siberia has mutated to be more or less virulent, um, but the one, in, the one in, uh, in, in Italy doesn't know, it has no communication, it's, it's so right. far away, it's never gonna be able to pick up the change by itself. So are you saying that the mutations can happen on a geographical level and not spread the same way that the virus itself is spreading? Yes, it certainly would happen on a geographical level because it's, it's not like a population-wide population, population change in the DNA. These mutations just crop up in individual viruses. And, and that's precisely what happened with this current virus is that um, the sort of hook on the outside of the um, envelope that, that connects to the receptor in the lung cell, that is the portion of the virus that mutated. Um, so, you know, that occurred somewhere close to Wuhan, uh, which is a geographical area. So yeah, it's, it's, it's geographic dependent. Mm. By the way, that, is that great... Is Go ahead. I was just going to say, it is to the virus's benefit to become less virulent so that um, the virus itself 
Um, because if a virus is quite virulent, infects a cell, makes thousands and thousands of copies, then it bursts the cells and destroys the very host that it needs. So it's to the virus's benefit to sort of, you know, lie low and create a less virulent um, kind of process. So what we have now is a kind of a kind of irrational, mean kind of virus. But on the other hand, it's yeah. in, in terms of the way it interfaces with humanity, it's brilliant uh, because it can travel so fast and hit so many people. That's you know, and and so yeah. that's. I, is, I, would you compare that to the process of evolution itself? Um, you know, once in a while you have a phenomenon that is um, that is so virulent that it can hit many more people. Um, and, and there's a mistake there. It's kind of psychopathic. It's a psychopathic, brilliant virus. Um, and, you know, that's, that's kind of scary um, because at the end of the day, humanity will still exist. Um, yeah. So will the virus. <laughs> right. So if you were going to do trials on this, uh, you know, with a, with a likely candidate or a series of candidates uh, for a vaccine, um, how do you do that? How do you do the trials without hurting anybody, but at the same time, um, you know, trying to find a successful candidate that will work? Right. So that's that's one of the reasons why it does take so long. You don't go from developing a potential um, vaccine that uh, you don't you don't go immediately into humans. It's got to be tested first in uh, what we call tissue culture in the laboratory. So uh, like on a um, you know human cells in 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 tissue in the in the laboratory, and then moved into uh, animals animal models, and then into very low doses in human beings to see first of all is it safe? Is it doing you know, we don't want to cause more harm than good. So that takes quite a long time to, you know, just, you know, to evaluate the safety of, of any particular vaccine. Um, and then the doses are uh, incrementally increased. And then we start looking at efficiency. Is it, is it triggering the immune system to attack the virus or not? So we have got to determine that it's safe, Secondly, we have to make sure it's efficient. Okay, then when, once we've checked all those boxes, then, then we've got the issue of ramping up the manufacture of the vaccine to, to you know, worldwide uh, availability. So it, it's, it's a long process. Yeah, I, I just, um, I wonder, you know, if you, if you take the, the national conversation on this, there's some people who say, okay, let's speed it up this time. Uh, let's take some chances. But what are the risks in moving too early? What, what, what could happen if we don't go through the whole trial sequence? Are, are you asking what is the risks of going into humans too early? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, one thing is it could overwhelm the uh, immune system to the extent that our, our response to the vaccine is worse than the virus itself. So if, if say we, you know, generate uh, a fevers of, you know, astronomical levels that, that, that could cause a lot more harm than good. Um, so we've got to take it one step at a time. I, I know that it will be expedited. And, and the hope is that, you know, we can identify some antiviral medications to at least, you know, treat or tamp down the, the symptoms of the, of the viral disease before this vaccine is is available. Yeah, you know one one possibility, logical possibility, it, it hits me is if you if you go too early, uh, is it possible that the punitive uh, vaccine uh, would encourage, would stimulate the virus to mutate? Um. That is precisely why viruses mutate, because they do want to avoid uh, the immune system. Um, you know, this is not a thought process on the part of the virus, but just in natural evolution, if they do then develop a mutation that allows it to kind of evade uh, attack by antibodies, then... Um, you know, the, then we've got a new disease that we're dealing with. 
Mm, yeah, that would be scary. Well, more scary. It was scary enough already. Um, yeah. The other thing is, uh, I wanted to I wanted to ask you, um, what about these drugs that have been talked about? You know, the ones that go for malaria and so forth. Um, is, there, is there any value there? It just it seems it seems really disconnect. You take a drug that has something to do with malaria and say, oh, this this will help you. And it's like, you know, there's a couple, three that the president has talked about, other people have talked about. Uh, Daniel Day Kim, one of the actors in Hawaii Five O, said he recovered using those. He, he recommends that, uh, or at least he says consider it. And, and I wonder yeah. if that's just pie in the sky or is this real medical genetic reason to, to use those drugs? Yeah, well, uh, there certainly, ha I, I mean, <laughs> I think there is reason to use them, but we, we you know, we need to establish you know the efficient the, the effectivity of these uh, of these medications. There are a whole class of medications. Uh, you know the hydrochloroquine that you just mentioned. There is another one that's already been through clinical trials and safety safety trials for for uh, the flu. Um, and then and then Tamiflu, another Tamiflu. one. Did, Tamiflu. Yeah, another um, no Tamiflu won't work for this virus. Okay. Um, okay. But another drug called Remdesivir will hopefully work for this virus. And another one I just read about today um, involves um, inserting a different type of nucleotide. Um, so it basically, uh, inserting into like getting a, 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 a different nucleotide into the viral genome so that it can't replicate. So there, there are not there are quite a number like uh, of different uh, antivirals that could potentially help treat this disease until we do have a vaccine. I have the feeling that uh, you know, although we talk about it in the United States, uh, the research may be going on elsewhere, like in Germany, for example, uh, or in or in Asia, um, and you know, it may it may pop up there as a success there. Maybe we don't, they don't have the same kind of FDA requirements. You know, it's easier to do it. Yeah. Uh, the other thought right. is that most of most of the drugs on the market today are made outside the U.S. So when you get to the manufacturing stage, we may have to rely on other countries to manufacture for us. No? Yeah. yeah, that's that's right. There, there are people working worldwide, certainly certainly in Europe and in China, and uh, you know throughout the world, different uh, yeah. laboratories and companies and scientists you know, attacking this from a multi-pronged uh, approach. Are you working on it actually, Sarah? No, I am not working on it. I um, work on a number of uh, human genetic diseases, not viral diseases, um, helped identify the genes for dwarfism and Huntington's disease and muscular dystrophy. And so my focus really has been on human genetic diseases, so hereditary diseases. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, certainly know a lot about genetics, of course. Of course. Um, can you tell, before we go, can you tell us about your book? Yeah, I um, wrote a work of fiction. I've written lots and lots of scientific articles, but a number of years ago, I actually was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. I'm completely fine now. But at the time I thought, okay, I'm gonna take on a new challenge and, and, and um, write a, a, a mystery novel. So it's a, it's a mystery thriller about a forensic geneticist um, in Iceland that uses the national DNA database to solve crimes, including that of her young brother that disappeared. And she ends up in a world of trouble. And it's, it's called double blind, which is a scientific term. Double Blind, the Icelandic Manuscript Murders. <laughs> I've got to see it. I, I visited Iceland last year and I've got to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot in there about Iceland. Sarah Winokur, a geneticist uh, who has helped us understand so many aspects of coronavirus. Thank you so much for appearing on Think Tech, Sarah. Thank you, Jay. It was a pleasure. Aloha. <laughs>